I'm, I guess, uh, is it okay now? <laughs> okay. So it's uh, 3.40, which is, I believe, a little bit better time than 2.40, because uh, anyone follows Ig Nobel Awards at all? Evidently, it started as a joke. Uh, these, are, these are actual awards given a week before the Nobel Award ceremony. And these are given to some real scientific research that was done for something that's totally irrelevant. No one would ever use it. And uh, it happens in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. And they uh, pretty lengthy process. And in fact, all the uh, Nobel laureates up in, uh, in the Massachusetts area come to deliver this award. I think the last, there's like 38 or 39 came in this year's. And one of the awards was given to the time that's the worst in the day for a talk like this one, where people are the most sleepiest. And evidently, that's uh, right around 90 minutes after you've had your lunch. So this, hopefully, is a better time than 2.40 or 2.30. So uh, my name is uh, Tariq Khan, and I'm uh, part of uh, HP's NFE business unit, focus on, on the cloud and SDN technologies and, and trying to figure out how we can apply cloud and SDN technologies to, to solve what's called as the NFE business case or the uh, or for network functions virtualization. And I'm here with my colleague. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Arun Tulasi. I'm, res I'm responsible for the uh, NFE platform solutions, which effectively distills what technologists build as possibilities into uh, products that we can deliver for our customers. Yeah. And uh, as you can see, our uh, our discussion for today is uh, DevOps or NFE, and I'm sure you know if you're here, obviously I don't need to talk about what DevOps is trying to do. It's essentially the two conflicting things that are out there. There's the, the uh, development teams and the teams that are trying to bring new capabilities. They, they want to be able to do it as fast as possible. And, and if you look at what NFE is about, it's about uh, how can you bring IT-style agility to the networks. So there's development teams, there's the business teams that have the pressure to get more and more capability as soon as possible. But on the other side, you have network operations whose job and whose metrics are really related to you know, how stable the environment is. And for them, making changes and bringing new things is another, another avenue for, for some, some downtime. So they, they resist it. So as you can see, there's a wall between the two. And uh, when we look at you know, I'm sure you know most of you are here uh, in some shape or form linked with telcos, either as a as the operator or someone providing solutions to them. We all know that for for the longest, the life cycles within within telcos within the production networks have been in in uh, years, not not months or quarters. And with NFE, what what started happening is that now. Earlier, everything used to come as a monolithic system. So very easy, you know, when you have a monolithic system coming in, you apply the, the principles. Now, you know, they weren't DevOps, but the principles of introducing new technology, you apply it to a contained environment. Um, very complicated, uh, you know, that's why they take so, such a long time because there were a lot of manual steps, but still you apply it to a monolithic uh, system. But with the network functions virtualization, at a minimum, you have three layers. You have the underlying hardware, so underlying compute, network, storage infrastructure. Then you have a layer of virtualization and virtualization control, which is obviously we're here. OpenStack provides that in a, in a very optimum way, and that, that, is, that has become a, a de facto uh, VIM, or virtualized infrastructure manager. And then you have the functions running on top of it. So now instead of one monolithic thing that, that had its life cycle, now there's at least these three layers, and these, each of these layers have multiple components. So now you have to worry about that. And then when we start looking at to introducing new capabilities, one of the difference that telcos of today have, and I know there's a lot of you know, forward-looking telcos out there that are trying to move to, to the next level beyond NFE, but, but today, most of the telcos, they consume solutions that someone else has developed. A, a vendor, a partner, someone else has developed. Telcos traditionally are not, not, they don't develop their own software. So you have a provider who has their own development, and before they, it gets over to the telcos, it goes through the life cycle that, that the uh, provider has. 
And then beyond that, you have a solution integrator. It could be an external solution integrator, or it could be the internal solution integrator. So those, whatever those new capabilities are coming in, need to go through that. And then you have the production deployment. And I know it's just a block out here. Production deployment is just not that. It kind of goes into multiple stages over there as well. But there is a life cycle. So, and, and if you're going to apply the, the DevOps principles, these DevOps principles are going to be applied to all of these. And for the most part, you know, people are transitioning to using the normal waterfall methodology instead of using it, using agile developments, and as part of agile developments, putting, putting some automated gates and, and the testing of those gates. So quite likely the provider that you're using would be using some kind of a life cycle management. But once these guys are going to give it to your solution integrator, your solution integrator is going to have their own life cycle. And then when you're going to get it as the, as the provider, of course, you're going to have your own life cycle. Now, the tasks are going to be slightly different, what each, each is going to do. But there it will be a life cycle that you're going to have to go through. And then can, can DevOps solve this? And, and uh, one of uh, our customers, uh, one of the telcos in, in the US, uh, the person who was assigned to do DevOps for them, she put it, uh, I think, the best way that anyone has put it uh, in this context, which was that we as telcos, we don't develop our software. And DevOps is development and operations. So how do you do DevOps for someone who doesn't develop? Which is the problem that essentially telcos are trying to solve. Um, but but the, the construct of this really comes down to and you, know, you can read everything that's written out there. Essentially, you want to be able to get repeatability. Because without repeatability, without being able to do it over and over again, you cannot do it faster. And when you have uh, repeatability, then you get that, that the, the process of incremental improvements. Because we know that once you automate something, it may be working bad. It may be no, not most optimum way of doing it. But once you have auto automated it, now you have set a baseline. And from that baseline, you need to continue improving. And you can come up with your own metrics. And there are some very, very good metrics available from the IT side of, for, for development that could be applied. And then the, the whole, whole idea of this thing is that how can you get benefits? Be the benefits be very small, but how can you get benefits to the end consumer as soon as possible? So, so to be able to do it, essentially what we are talking about is how can we move from infrastructure as art, which is what essentially is done at most of the places, to infrastructure as code? And we're going to talk a little bit more about infrastructure and code uh, in, in a couple of more slides. But essentially leading into not have these big releases that bring a lot of capabilities, but to have small releases that you can keep bringing to a subset of your population, of your user population, and then bring them over to, to everywhere. And then, you know, ultimately boiling down to these time vampires out there, how can you minimize them? It, uh, so uh, to be able to do it, we've got to do a lot of testing. Because there's, when you test, you find faults, and then you go back and, and, uh, and be able to, uh, to uh, work through those faults or, or errors. There's a number of tests out there. And, and quite likely, all of these you're going to be doing at different parts of the cycle. You know, some of these are going to be done by by the part, by the provider, some by the solution integration team, and some absolutely you're going to have to do it before putting it in your production. So before we go into some of the options available out there, and, and we're kind of going to close it with, you know, we at HPE have some solutions and how we're using these DevOps principles to build the solutions and how we could enable some of these capabilities once these solutions are deployed in your in your, uh, um, uh, in your environment, how you can leverage some of the same principles, same tooling to be able to, uh, to go beyond it. So uh, again, before going too far, I thought that uh, you know, there's a lot of terms out there related to DevOps, use interchangeably, you know, CX, you know, CI, continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous XYZ. So we thought uh, you know, we'll, we'll define it a little bit. Um, and uh, some of you might uh, still say that this is overly simplistic. You know, in my environment, I really don't have these five stages. I have seven. I have nine stages. But, but the, the principles are, are somewhat similar. 
So continuous integration is, is essentially related to, it's more of a development and QA efficiency improvement <laughs> process. So what, what continuous Im improvement, oops, I apologize, continuous integration does is to be able to, for, for a developer to make a change in a code, to be able to submit the code to, to the, uh, to the uh, source code repository, a shared source code repository, and once that is submitted and committed, then it triggers some automated tests, and, and that becomes the first QA test or QA of the code. So, so before a, a human being looks at the, at the code, there's a process that you have gone through and you have run through some tests so that if you don't pass it, essentially it's rolled back and, and the developer need to continue working. The QA team doesn't need to be engaged. But once it goes past it, then the QA team can, can be engaged. Then beyond continuous integration comes uh, continuous testing, which takes the same process, but it goes from development to QA and to staging as well. And the staging env environment is somewhat similar to, to the production environment. So over here, you're able to catch issues that potentially are gonna happen in, in, in the production uh, floor. Then the next term that comes up is uh, continuous delivery, which essentially takes the same process all the way over to production. And, and at some times people say that continuous delivery arguably is the nirvana land where you're able to take these changes and, and move them over to your production, essentially being able to do things like uh, add new capabilities to a subset of users. You, uh, you have to put policies in place so that, that you can actually do that and, and take it over to production. But, but we would argue that uh, you know, there's another step that, that you would go to, which is uh, continuous assessment as well. This essentially goes to, to be able to, once something is deployed, so as part of your, your QA and staging process, you, you use some testing tools to be able to validate either performance or functionality. What we would argue is that you use a subset of those, those use cases to be able to characterize and validate your production environment as well. And when you see the variance between what you tested and what is, is on the floor becomes more than acceptable, then you take it back to your planning and architecture cycle and be able to close the loop. And uh, the nirvana land of this, uh, if, if there's going to be an IT or cloud example, um, in my humble opinion, has been, uh, has been Netflix. And there, there's a, the, good, the great thing about Netflix is they have been putting a lot of IP out there in open source. You can go read up. And I think the, one of the most wonderful jobs that uh, any geek could have it is to be, uh, to be running Netflix's Chaos Monkey. Have you guys heard of, heard of it? This is, this is how they have built their environment that Chaos Monkey is really a piece of software that they let loose against their production workloads to go and kill stuff. And if you're actually able to impact the end service, you get a bonus. <laughs> For that is the nirvana land where we, you know, with network or, or any production folks uh, we are able to get to, then we know that we are doing DevOps and CI CD the way it was meant to be done. And uh, now coming back to the reality of what, what we have, and uh, as most of you guys would have seen it, and within, we talked about those three layers, but within each layer, there are other layers as well, and perhaps Arun can uh, walk us through it. Sure. So uh, one of the differences between uh, the legacy environment that Tariq mentioned earlier, where you buy a single package from a, car, from a vendor, uh, which provides a services, you have a very definitive cycle of when you're going to get an upgrade, and you're able to roll with it. But when you are moving to the, the NFE world, where you want to be able to go pick up the right components that you like and build your own solution, uh, there is a number of things that you have to contend with. Uh, OpenStack has its own release cycle. You know, Open Daylight has its own release cycle. And then as, as a developer, you have your own configuration management software. You have your own release cycle. And the solutions that you want to source from your vendors, they continue to run on their own release train. In essence, what used to be a you know, just click a button and buy a big box, even if it takes nine months, you still have that one big box to contend with, has sort of changed where you have to now do your own stuff. So how do we, how do we bring in these various different elements that go on completely different tracks together? So that's, that's a problem uh, DevOps is trying to address. 
before we, we start with, you know, what does my DevOps environment need, uh, we'll have to remember, you know, uh, there's one set of principles that we need to follow to make sure we are compliant with, you know, what the community or the industry is putting out there, and then choose the right set of tools uh, that would help us get there. Looking through the processes, number one, you know, have your infrastructure as code. So, uh, you know, 11, 11 p.m. in the night, you get a call, three of your servers are down, how do you recreate those servers? Do you need to find the person who actually built the servers to recreate it from scratch, or would you like your infrastructure to be built as code where you have a set of software packages that anyone could deploy, just like you deploy a software application to bring the servers back up again? I'm fairly certain you'd choose option B because it makes life simpler. So you need to start using or treating your infrastructure just as you treat uh, your software components. Uh, move from uh, an imperative uh, mechanism to a declarative uh, mechanism where instead of telling the server what it needs to do, or instead of telling your resource what it needs to do, tell the resource what it needs to become. So uh, in, the, in the older days, when you want to set up a server, there were 10 different steps that you had to perform for each configuration element that you wanted to push in. But with you know, various configuration management technologies and the, well, and the evolution in that space, uh, you are able to specify the end state of your environment and not worry about how exactly it's done. You can essentially off, offload it mm -hmm. uh, to that uh, configuration management technology. So be aware of what's available out there uh, so that you can extend it. Uh, and lastly, you know, a combination of you know, what is test-driven development or, or agile development, have shorter development cycles, test, test, and retest until you can move to the next phase. In essence, break down uh, your development cycle into uh, much smaller quantities. In the sense, you don't have a big bang test that, that happens uh, during the time of your release. Instead, every smaller phase has its own test cycle uh, that validates uh, the functionality of just built. So what are the, what are the tools uh, uh, that you need to consider uh, when you want to move to a DevOps environment? Uh, what's, the, what's the most elemental thing that you build? It is your code. So you need to find a way to have a source code management system that fits the kind of development model you have. Do you have a geographically distributed team? Do you have your team in just one location? Is your product made up of you know, 10 different streams, all of which need to work independently? All this needs to factor into your choice of source code management tool. Secondly, not all SCM tools are created the same way, uh, and not all your uh, deliverables are also built the same way. So you have code that you have in your source code repository, but what happens uh, if you have uh, a large image? So for instance, if you pick a tool like Git, it is not an ideal fit for storing you know, a four gig image or whatever. So you need to find a completely different kind of a repository, an artifact repository, for elements that do not fit uh, that model. So you have your code, you have your artifacts. How do you make sure your code, uh, how do you make sure uh, the integrity of the code uh, is always intact? So you have a review management system which is going to hold that gate to make sure your code is properly vetted before it can ever get into a release cycle. You have multiple developers, you have multiple reviewers. Uh, how do you keep track of these changes? So uh, you know, once your code is built, reviewed, how do you validate it automatically? So when someone submits code, and when that code gets reviewed, mm -hmm. how does it automatically trigger your test process so that uh, this entire cycle is hands-off? Mm -hmm. Someone submits code, it gets automatically uh, tested, passes the review, and gets back into your master branch. So you need to use uh, an integration engine to have your DevOps cycle roll uh, completely hands-off uh, we talked about uh, infrastructure as a code, and a configuration management system is one way uh, you could drive your infrastructure as code. And again, there are a variety of tools that are available, some of which uh, you know, we'll talk about in the future slides, how we've actually used them. Uh, test harnesses. Today, uh, open source communities are coming up with their own test harnesses, so Rally and Tempest, available from the OpenStack community. Uh, we have uh, Q-tip, Yardstick, and other similar tools available from the OpenFE community. These are tools that the community has built either to validate functionality 
or scale of the environment. So be aware of what's available out there uh, so that you can leverage them. Uh, and lastly, you know, flexible deployment engines. So in your production environment or in your integration in environment, you probably need to deploy you know, bare metal nodes. However, if you're a developer, you should, you should probably be able to test your code in your own laptop. So how can you provide a flexible deployment model without having to commit to your resources for hardware? And then there are tools available for that as well. Uh, so be aware of what's available out there uh, and decide which one's right for your environment. And Arun, I think before you go to the next slide, uh, I know we said code so many times. And you know, for folks who are in operations, you'd be wondering, you know, code, you know, I don't do coding, I don't do code. But in this case, because we're talking about infrastructure as code, and because if you look at what is it that NFV of today is doing, what we're doing is there's a whole platform management component that we need to be able to handle, which, you know, that's the infrastructure as code and we're gonna go a little bit into it. How do you develop the, or manage your infrastructure or your OpenStack platform, OpenStack controllers, uh, host operating systems, anything related to, to, you know, that's providing the NFVI and the VIM. But then when you go to the VMs or VNFs, today's VNFs, 90%, 95% of them are deployed as VMs. Now, what, how do we deploy them? Yes, there are some people who might go and have, you know, Nova Boot and Neutron uh, Net Create and all of those things, but most, most people are moving towards, you know, some sort of heat-based deployment. What is heat? It's a bunch of templates. What, is, what are those templates? They're actually code. What we're talking about is that when we're saying infrastructure as code, all the artifacts related to be able to deploy something need to be treated as source code, need to be version controlled, need to be able to do all of those things. So this, what we're talking about is not just related to the actual development of applications, but it's related to anything that we're doing on, on our solution, be it we are deploying things that are coming from others in, in VMs where you wouldn't associate development or code with those. He's just one slide ahead, so. <laughs> so uh, again, uh, the, the idea of infrastructure as code is to allow you uh, the option to recreate an environment the exact same way it was before it failed uh, without having to rely on any other resources than the, uh, than the recipes or the playbooks or the manifests uh, that you've already built. Uh, so what, what is infrastructure on code? Again, as Tarek mentioned, you know, in, in the, the act of fashion he did, it is configuration management on steroids. So uh, whatever, whatever terminologies or technologies you, apl you applied to the building of your code uh, for applications is now extended uh, across out to your infrastructure. So treat it the exact same way as you would uh, your source code. I mean, that means using a version control, uh, using the review mechanism, uh, using uh, an integration engine uh, that you deploy it. So, going forward, so we wanted to talk about how uh, this translates uh, into an actual environment. Uh, how does it take you from, for instance, your source repository all the way uh, out to your uh, production deployment? So, okay. I'll pass it thank you. Yeah. So as we touched on declarative topology model, I know these uh, software developers, they keep on coming up with these new terms. Uh, I think at the last OpenStack Summit, if some of you were able to uh, make it across the world to uh, Tokyo, there was a discussion on IBN, intent-based networking. There's a lot of other uh, discussions going on. You must have heard intent-based XYZ, intent-based uh, orchestration. This declarative topology model, these are all declarative. And, and the difference being, instead of saying go build this by doing this, 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 and this, you essentially say what do I want it to be? What do I need to be done? What the end state needs to look like? And that delegate the doing of the things and delegate the actual steps, steps associated with doing it to a, a, some kind of a intelligent system. Now, there's a number of those out there, right? Uh, the, the chef, puppet, CF Engine, Ansible, these all work on, on a declarative model. And, and in this one, there's really two things you're talking about. You're talking about what do you need, need at the end of it, and then there's going to be some kind of configuration you're gonna provide at some point so that you know, how, it's, how, how do you get to you know, what, what, what 
state you, you want. And another example of this is, uh, oh, that's a little bit. So another example of this is that you have a topology that you come up with. And in this case, you know, what we have done is, just imagine you have a, it's a CPE or some kind of a uh, end device orchestration where you have a router, you need to have some kind of van optimization, perhaps some kind of firewalling or ACLs to be put in place. What, so you create a model that you deploy the, the router and then you need to have these things in the, in the path of the actual uh, user so, so that they're, they're, when they access the, the service, they go through these. Now, in the design, you're going to decide how, how do you want to be able to instantiate. Do you want the router to be you know, an HA-enabled router, which means you want two instances of it, and then, you know, I don't know why you wouldn't want HA at other places, but just imagine you don't want HA, you go over there, and then once you orchestrate, then you're able to get it to the way you need it to be. Now, you don't have to go and say that I need this kind of server for it, I need this kind of, you know, um, uh, virtualization layer at it. That decision could, could have been made by, by a different team. But for you to be able to do this, you essentially assign some characteristics to it and then be able to deploy it, it to the appropriate one where the, the job of what needs to be done to actual doing is, is uh, disaggregated. And this provides a, a slightly different uh, workflow where you may have the, the operations guys, oh, I apologize, you ha may have the operations guys who are essentially managing the, the, your configuration management engine. But you have the providers that are, that are providing the VNF, the actual VNX that are coming in. They'll be providing you know, all the metadata related to it. To be able to run this VNF, I need XYZ. I need to be able to deploy it on this kind of platform. These are my requirement. I need this kind of you know, bandwidth or this kind of networking. Then you, you put all of these things into the, that single source repository. Your artifacts go into you know, the art, artifact repository that Arun had touched on earlier. Then it's the integration engine that decides based on which gate you are in, where you're deploying. And on the basis of, of what policies you have put in place, in dev, I need to be able to deploy this way, in QA this way, and so and so forth. So, so there's so operations is involved in the decision-making process, and operations is the one that controls this part, the different targets that you have, and the provider, or in your case, it could be a developer, it could be the folks who are defining the service. They have a part in it where they're, de they're defining some of the characteristics that are required. And uh, what, what we thought was, uh, since this is a telco crowd, so let's take an example. And you know, being uh, at OpenStack Summit, why not take an open source example? So there's a, a project Clearwater out there. Uh, our friends at uh, Metaswitch, they have uh, uh, put it on, uh, on uh, open source. It's uh, basically a full IMS system. An IMS IP multimedia system. This essentially is the system that that's able to that allows you to make your phone calls and or watch videos and, and so and so forth. So for for something like this, this is uh, their, their actual architecture. And if you look at their components, you look at this that there's you know these two, which are providing some some telco functions, but they're really using you know a Cassandra database, which is a big data type workload. Then you have these two workloads. They are basically using, very heavily using memcached, which is more very memory intensive workload. And then you have this, this, which is providing this CSCF or essentially providing WebRTC, which is the actual call, the actual communication that's happening. So different characteristics for, for this. And then when you go over to it and you, apply, you know, try to use the the, uh, some of the processes that we talked about, you essentially define the topology, and when you're defining the topology, you don't say where it needs to be deployed. You just define the required characteristics, which may be these, and you define what the required capabilities are, where you're gonna deploy it, and then when you go ahead and deploy it, depending on where it's going, it could be deployed as a combination of you know, wherever, containers, KVM, or it could be deployed in your production environment where you may have a very structured 
structured uh, resource pools where you know, you're providing storage intensive. You may choose to combine the memory and network I.O. workload. You may keep it separate. But this is how you're able to disaggregate your topology from your actual deployment or, or environment. And now Lance is uh, very politely telling us only 10 minutes left, so we've got to hurry up so there's some time for questions. So anyway, this is, uh, uh, Arun had touched on uh, OPNFE a little bit. By the way, OPNFE is using a CI-CD process, and that is a real-life uh, um, deployment, uh, open source, community-based deployment. Uh, they, they are using it, very similar to what, what uh, everything we have talked about. And now Arun is going to walk us through what we are doing with some of the, uh, the HPE products uh, that hopefully some of you are going to end up using or are already using. Thanks, Arik. So uh, until now, we looked at you know, what are the possibilities, you know, recommendations, best practices. Uh, have we actually put these things to use? Has HP put these things to use? Has a community project put these things to use? So that's what we wanted to, to capture in the rest of the section. So uh, the earlier slide, you, you looked at uh, the reference architect architecture deployment for OpNFE's Octopus project, which is their uh, CACD project. And just quickly jumping back to it, it's very similar to what we talked about. You know, developers push their code to get it. It automatically uh, you know, creates a process, a Jenkins process. Everything gets validated. The results go back. And then the code is merged back to the uh, OpNFE repository. And then as you can see, there are external artifacts like you know, OpenStack or OpenDaylight or Onos or any, any open source component that you want to bring in. Jenkins ensures they get pulled in as well. So, uh, you know, we, we have an example of, of a very relevant, you know, telco-friendly community already uh, using this process. We also have HP's own uh, Helium OpenStack uh, using a similar process. So we have, uh, you know, Ansible playbooks uh, that effectively take in the right tree. So the, the Git repo you see down there, they're able to locate what version you're trying to build uh, and build the appropriate system. And this approach uh, has been extended to non-OpenStack products within, uh, within the Helion portfolio as well. Uh, overall, the, the CI-CD mechanism that we are talking about isn't vastly different from what OpenStack itself does, which is one of the complex projects out there. You know, so many different streams, so many different developers, so many different countries. So it's, it's easier for us to take a, a proven mechanism uh, that OpenStack already validates, that OpenFE already uses, and take it into you know, a platform uh, that we can build on our own, uh, which is the, uh, the NFE platform. And as you can see, it has components uh, that span from the physical infrastructure, what we call the NFE infrastructure layer, uh, right to uh, a production-ready VNF. And for us to bring together the infrastructure, the infrastructure management tools, OpenStack, an SDN controller, a bunch of VNFs, along with their VNF manager, and a global orchestrator, it's going to be next to impossible without using you know, what we talked about earlier, uh, a true uh, CI-CD-based uh, mechanism. Uh, and the goal for the, the platform is you know, to, be, to be able to easily deploy it. Again, that's where the infrastructure as code uh, principle comes in. Uh, all the components you see below, the server, storage, and networking, they are built in a you know, predictable, repeatable way because uh, the platform uses uh, the infrastructure as code principles. Uh, it has to be easier for us to support and maintain the environment. Again, the only way we are able to do that is by using a configuration management tool that can provide converged upgrades for the platform instead of trying to upgrade every component at a time. So, you know, uh, there are actual use cases uh, that the platform requires uh, that come in from the CI/CD approach. And this is just an example of uh, the various tools uh, that we've used. Again, our, our sources uh, use uh, you know, Git as a repository. We, we use the Maven project for our uh, artifact repository. Uh, we talked about trying to use test-driven development. So we have a three-week sprint cycle that helps us test every feature at every release gate instead of trying to test it when we go to a general availability or a lab release gate. Uh, you know, code components are uh, uh, managed under Git, which ties into a Git system and a Jenkins system. You know, what we saw in the uh, project Octopus slide earlier is something that we have tried to replicate on our own uh, because it's telco friendly. And essentially, our goal is to 
be able to build uh, this entire platform. One, it's simpler to buy, uh, it's easier to deploy. Again, one of the challenges that we have in the legacy world is you order a system uh, from ideation to implementation, it goes anywhere between 12 to 18 months. But with, with the system that's built using the CI CD principles, you know, using infrastructure as code, having all these release gates, trying to incorporate test driven uh, development, we are able to go from you know, 36, uh, zero to 36 days uh, from the time your order uh, has been placed. Uh, managed as a single system, again, because we use a configuration management tool, uh, it's easier for us to look at the entire platform as, uh, as a single platform instead of just a collection of uh, multiple products. Uh, with that said, uh, I think we yeah. have just. With that a said, uh, we have about five minutes for questions. So if there are any questions, uh, there are two mics. Uh. Hello. Hello. It's a beautiful presentation. Thank you. So, one of the key things that telco service provider operation teams wants, apart from delivering stuff, is a good documentation. Mm -hmm. They love documentation. So, how do you produce? that high quality documentation as output of your sprints? Are you converting your user stories into a documentation or you assign another user so story, continuous user story for documentation? Thank so you. Every user story for its success criteria needs to have the relevant documentation. And if you look at uh, how our external facing documentation looks, what we effectively do is take the documentation that's attached to the user story before we close it and pull it into our web page directly. So that's exactly what our documentation team does. Without someone submitting a test plan that can be automated, and without having the documentation for the feature that you have built, you cannot close a user story. I, it does not leave that sprint. Mm -hmm. So that's one way for us to address this. Any other questions or comments? Do you have uh, feedback loops in your architecture? I saw you kind of had that isolated to the left. Yeah. No, so that's, we're not there yet. And if we go back to the second slide, which talked about different folks have their own CI CD. So the providers and the, uh, the solution integrators and the operators. Now, one of the, each of these could have their own tooling. It doesn't require to have the same tooling, but if they have the same tooling and it's the open source tooling that's used by a huge, you know, large community, it makes it easier. What we'd love to be able to do is, but you know, love to have any operators over here and get their thoughts. But we'd love to be able to capture the the events and the the uh, from the running system that we are able to pull back to our development systems to be able to close the loop. Right now, we are just closing the loop between our testing and our architecture cycle. Thank you. Well, folks, if uh, no other. Oh, there's one more question. Uh, do you have a certified bill of material for uh, for your package solution? I'm yes. sorry. Is there a bill of material yeah. for the? There absolutely, absolutely is. Yes. yes. Uh, so yes. that's available on your website, or? Yes, it is. You you would just want to Google up you know NFE system, and you should be able to get and uh, information on what the yeah. what the bill like of material. Is. Multiple options with like small, yeah. medium, large, or. That is, yeah. you're you're taking slides from the other larger yeah. NFE system yeah. presentation. So yes, there is a. That is, you can grow from like a four compute node version to a 64 compute node yeah. version. Thereabouts. And, and uh, to, to the, the question, uh, the thing is we, if you have bought HP, uh, HP equipment, which we hope you have, the, our bill of materials, like anyone else, they're not easiest. They're pretty long, they're pretty intensive. What with NFE system we have done is that we have building blocks, blocks. and those building blocks are limited number of SKUs. But of course, you know, should you want to Delve deep into, you know, I don't want to care about just this starter system, four node, one enclosure starter system. No, I want to know what actually is in there. So that information is available as well. Well, folks, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. And uh, we are absolutely.